Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a review of chapter 956, Big News. And that title is a bit of an understatement because this is exactly what I was hoping for and more after the end of Act 2 of Wano was announced last week. And wow, do we have a lot to talk about with several massive, massive topics here, but I'd like to begin with something that is less speculatory, which is the abolishment of the seven Warlords of the Sea. Now, this is quite possibly the biggest event to have occurred in the series since Whitebeard's demise at Marineford. And honestly, it's pretty crazy to think that there are just no more Warlords. This system has been a staple of One Piece since the days of East Blue. These insurmountable figures, one of the three great powers of the world, world have played an integral role in the entire journey of the series, and the world will never look the same without them. For the record, I think this is a terrible decision, not from a narrative perspective, I love that, but from the perspective of the Marines and the world government. Making an enemy of people like Mihawk and Weevil just seems like a really bad idea, and I highly doubt that any of the ex wallets will be captured, even Buggy. Well, maybe Buggy. But the thing is that you now have someone like the world's greatest swordsman running loose on the seas of the world and your forces no longer have any sort of immunity to his devastating power. And at a time when you're concerned with the idea of a Yonko alliance, it just seems like perhaps not the best thing to do. However, from a political perspective, it is easy to see the reasoning. And I did really like that it was brought about through both Cobra and Riku leading the charge because their kingdoms were almost obliterated by former warlords abusing their positions of power. And the other thing we need to remember is that we don't have all the information here. The world government are corrupt as hell, but they are no fools. And and if they are confident enough to part ways with these figures, then they may very well have reason to be, which I suppose could be found in the form of whatever new development Vegapunk has, which Fujitora was talking about during the Reverie. Also just sidestepping briefly, speaking of the Reverie, I'm glad we finally have a solid timeline and resolution on it because it will finally put an end to people insisting that the Reverie is still ongoing and that we will travel back to it at some stage. Like I suspected, it is over and the events are going to be told to us in little packets of information like this. And not only that, but the Reverie has been over for an entire week, which means that its figures could be anywhere by now, which is particularly important when we're thinking of the members of the Grand Fleet who are present, as they could easily be on their way to Wano as we speak. But back to the Warlords, it was really fantastic to see what remains of them in this chapter. It feels like it's been an awfully long time since we've had the pleasure of seeing most of them, especially as a collective. My favorite appearance was Boa Hancock though, and I think she was just a great way to cap off the chapter. I love the panel of her just sitting confidently on Amazon Lily, because it just exudes power and makes her words all the more poignant. The Marines are in for one hell of a fight, and unless they've taken Vegapunk's development with them, I I think they're in for one hell of a loss as well. Here's the thing though, I don't think it's inconceivable for us to be left with this cliffhanger in regards to them and then cut back after Wano to discover that they have all been defeated and or captured. I mean, it might be difficult to believe in the case of Mihawk in particular, but it would certainly hype up the world government as an even bigger threat than we'd anticipated. And it would also be a good show of power for Vegapunk's work because I imagine that this would be the only way such a thing would be possible. Otherwise, I imagine that the Warlords will just go on to ally themselves elsewhere. You know, Boa to Luffy, possibly Buggy as well. Although actually Mihawk and Weevil are very much powerful enough to just remain as lone forces. Either way, post Wano, the One Piece world is going to be completely unrecognizable with the fall of two Yonko and the abolishment of the Warlords and I just cannot wait. Now the next gigantic piece of news is a bit more speculative because essentially Morgan's revealed that there was a death at the Reverie as well as an attempted assassination. And this chapter heavily implies through the reactions of the revolutionaries, the Mountain Bandits and Makino that Sabo may have met his demise. Now, first of all, I want to stress that despite all of the trolls on the internet spewing Sabo is dead, in all caps in an attempt to spoil people, this was never confirmed in the chapter. I believe that is what Oda would like us to believe dramatically, but is almost certainly not the case. And as evidence toward this, I'd like to point out that there is nothing in the chapter relating to Sabo that could not double as the other big event of the Reverie. If you look at everyone's reactions, yes, they're incredibly despairful, especially Makino, but for the most part, people seem more shocked and in sheer disbelief than anything else. And this could very nicely fit into the other piece of news, which is the assassin assassination attempt. Now, if Morgans had published a story claiming that Sabo had attempted to kill someone at the Reverie, perhaps a member of royalty or a world noble, then these reactions would fit pretty perfectly as well. Now, I will recognize the possibility that the newspaper is referring to his death, but even if this is the case, it is surely misdirection by Oda for a revelation later on. And I think that we all need to casually stop stating that Sabo is dead, because even if Morgans did report his obituary, we know it's not true. Characters in One Piece are absurdly hard to kill, and if there's no body on screen, then it did not happen. From a narrative perspective, killing Sabo is also, in my opinion, an abysmal decision to make. So I've done a whole video on reasons why I'm not Sabo's greatest fan, which involves the various ways in which his presence destabilizes an otherwise very tight story, which you know, check it out if you'd like. But my main point here is that the only way this situation could be made any worse is if Sabo died before he actually had a chance to make a narrative impact. Oda did not pull Sabo out of his ass and cram him into the story just to have him die off screen like this. What I will admit to though is not really understanding the reasons why the world government would lie and say that he's dead if they'd simply captured 
captured him. For example, if they'd caught him, then you'd figure they could use Sabo being alive to lure out the other members of the Revolutionary Army in a similar manner to which Ace was used to face off against Whitebeard. But I'm really not sure what advantage the world government would gain from keeping him alive after faking his death, which actually makes me lean more towards the idea that Sabo was reported to be involved in the assassination attempt story, even if he obviously isn't the one responsible for the act. I mean, we know for example that Vivi may have been chosen to be snuffed out of history. So what if an attempt on her life was made and Sabo having been defeated and captured during his skirmish with Fujitora and Ryukugu was blamed for it? The world government could then go on to use him, as I stated before, to lure out the Revolutionary Army and perhaps even create Marine for 2.0, which I have to say was one of the things I was really worried about with the Sabo character, because I really do not want any more similarities to Ace and him being captured by the Marines would just continue this mirror image game. However, if I'm right here and Sabo's implied death is just misdirection, then well, we need to talk about who actually died. One answer was brought up before being Vivi, who we know may be a target of Eamon, therefore the Gorosei and therefore the entirety of the world government. And I think that that would just be the most depressing news possible. However, we do know for a fact that Luffy, Blackbeard, and Shirahoshi are fine, which were the other images Eam was looking at. So uh, until I see her face, I will be fearing the worst for Vivi. But if she isn't dead, then the assassination attempt was at the very least on her life because Scarp did state that there was an incident with the Alabaster Kingdom. And I mean, I suppose it could also be King Cobra. He was old, frail, and far too curious for his own good. Even requesting a meeting with the Gorosei, he could have been killed and even had the death stage as being of old age. But basically there are options here and I don't think we should be jumping to conclusions as of yet because we just don't have have enough information. Now, as for the distributor of said information, Big News Morgans is always a pleasure to see, and I loved his character moment in the chapter where he proclaimed to be a proud journalist, although he did admit to misleading people from time to time. Plus, he's a pretty powerful dude himself, managing to knock out a member of Cypherpol, which even if this dude is from one of the lower cells, that's no easy feat for a civilian, so Morgans has some moves. And just on this for a second, the guy that the Cypherpol agent was impersonating is actually a profound tertiary character named Attach, who actually once headed up the Marine Photographics Department. He's the one who supplied the photo for the Straw Hat Bounties, for example. Although he was let go after the Paramount War for making a total of 57 blunders, one of which was leaving the lens cap on whilst taking a photo of Sanji, leading to the notorious sketch. In any case, it's not clear if Attach has always been a Cypherpol agent or if the agent was impersonating Attach, but I would be leaning towards the latter. But of course, Morgan's section had one more tantalizing piece of intrigue because it ended with a call from a certain Wapol, claiming to have some information. Now I find this interesting because Morgan's assumedly already has all of the big scoops. So Wapol, rather uncharacteristically, was probably calling to provide some sort of truth, clarifying one of the big three news items. And remember this call was prior to any kind of publication, so whatever information Walpole did provide will have been in the newspaper. Now there's a lot more intrigue in this massively packed chapter. And next up, let's take a look at the very casual appearance of Blackbeard. Now Blackbeard very much stands out in this chapter because he seemingly has nothing to do with the majorly focused upon plot points, being the warlords, the death or the assassination attempt. Instead, Blackbeard is after a very classically unnamed Japanese object. And this is another one of those scenarios where there were horrible scans floating around with contradictory information, one of which referred to this thing as them as in plural. This is not the case. And the official translation clearly states that whatever Blackbeard is after is a single thing. Now, both he and the Marines have a vested interest in this, which can only lead us to speculation of great importance. The first thing that would come to mind is obviously the final road poneglyph. That's pretty essential for Blackbeard's ultimate goal. And it would also be of paramount interest to the Marines to confiscate. However, it could also be perhaps an ancient weapon being either Pluton or Uranus, as I highly doubt it would be Shirohoshi, aka Poseidon. But it is nice to see Blackbeard making a move and using the chaos of the world to his advantage, as he is ever so proficient at doing. While everything plays out on Wano and with the Warlords, he's just casually building up his empire to be become the final boss of the series. I will say that despite the implications of his words, this part was probably my least favorite bit of the chapter, just because I think it's a really boring close up of Blackbeard. There's nothing hugely dynamic about the panel and artistically it just seems a bit lacking in the chapter with so many beautifully drawn panels catching up with key characters. Like Mihawk, Drake, Boa Hancock, Doflamingo, so many characters have drawings that I had trouble taking my eyes away from. But with Blackbeard, it was just kind of like, um, okay, let's move on. Despite the fact that what he's talking about is probably in reality, the most important plot point of the chapter. Although to be fair, I guess there isn't much that could artistically trump his appearance in the previous interlude. Next up, more major news, and we actually have the introduction of another organization this week with S.W.O.R.D., a specialist faction of the Marines, kind of like their own militaristic version of Cypherpol, I guess, which is a nice contrast because CP0 are known as Aegis, which is a shield in Greek mythology. So that would leave us with S.W.O.R.D. versus S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, and of course, S.W.O.R.D. are captained by a certain Diaz Drake. I should say that whether or not S.W.O.R.D. is officially connected with the Marines is very much up in the air at the moment. And I say this because if it were mandated by the Marines, then I'm not so sure that Kizaru would have engaged in combat with Drake on Sabadi. 
unless of course it was a very, very clever ruse. If anything though, S.W.O.R.D. might be an independent faction of the Marines with a sense of justice that doesn't quite align with how the world government uses the Marine organization and working towards a revolution from the inside. So I do love this revelation though, because all of a sudden Drake's actions in the story make perfect sense. And it's also a very good sign that he will more than likely be making a temporary alliance with Luffy because you know, for the greater good and all. Plus Drake did seem quite concerned with Luffy's current status and it's almost certain that he is the one who let Laura escape after decimating Hawkins. What's more interesting though, is that Kobe is also a member of S.W.O.R.D. and I love that even more than the reveal of Drake. It's always great to see Kobe moving on up in the world because he's become such a reliable guy. Also one more point of interest is that the way to identify S.W.O.R.D. members may be through a shared feature that both Drake and Kobe have, which is their scars. Now this might be and likely is completely coincidental, but there are a few other Marines who bear a similar scar. There's also Very Good and maybe even Doberman who according to his scars may be a member of several different S.W.O.R.D organizations. Oh, and we also should not forget one Admiral Fujitora. Once again, pure speculation, we really should not be considering anybody with a scar as a sword member. I just thought it was interesting that Kobe and Drake share that very similar marking. But scars aside, this also might be where we start considering the possibility of Kuzan also being a member of Sword, infiltrating Blackbeard's crew in the same way that Drake did with Kaido. Maybe there's even a member in Big Mom's crew as well. Who knows? But let's go on to address our ongoing cover story. Beige has landed at Dress Rosa and rather conveniently, they've run into someone who knows Lola. And it's pretty funny how he says that she's actually managed to find a husband referring to Beige and mistaking Chiffon for Lola. So maybe this is going to put the fire tank pirates on a path that doesn't necessarily lead to Thriller Bark. Although someone raised a great point many, many chapter reviews ago, which is that Thriller Bark isn't even in the Florian Triangle anymore, as it was seen when Gecko Moria stormed Blackbeard's Island. In which case Lola and her crew must have left somehow and who knows where they are now. It might be in the new world, but it could still be in paradise because assumedly Lola fled Totland in the new world and may have stopped in a dress Rosa before moving into paradise. So I remain as intrigued as always. And finally, I just want to get somewhat serious here for a second because this week, as amazing as the chapter was, it did show us a truly despicable side of the online One Piece fan base. Now, obviously the events here were pretty earth shaking with massive implications for everything going forward, but I was honestly astounded by the sheer amount of people who went out of their way to spoil it, particularly the abolishment of the warlords and the potential of Sabo's death. You could not go anywhere without someone recklessly posting all cap spoilers or just straight up scanned pages. Even my own YouTube comment section wasn't safe as all of a sudden and videos were bombarded with comments like Sabo is dead with no regard for others whatsoever. And I know that this is a very small minority of fans. Most of you are amazing with spoilers and great human beings as well, but that small group of you are the scum of the earth and a huge reason why this particular fan base can become so toxic. And I just want you all to know that no amount of ruining experiences for others is going to fill the void of misery in your lives. But thankfully for everyone else, One Piece is so damn good that even when it's spoiled, it is still phenomenal. And that pretty much does it for chapter 956. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of your amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.